We have just, in our Hoodview Bible experience, come nearly to the end of Deuteronomy, the fifth of the first five books of the Bible, and uh, we've come to the almost the very end of the journey from, uh, from Egypt of the Israelites into Canaan, right on the brinks of Canaan, and what I wanted to do this morning was kind of have a little bit of a summative reflection on what we've encountered so far. I have to tell you, this is not a sermon I've been looking forward to eagerly. This is not something I really thought, man, I just can't wait to talk about that. That's going to be really enjoyable. Um, for, for my preaching, personally, I try to preach at least one or two really encouraging sermons for every sermon that's difficult. So I feel like there are people here that are going through just difficult times of life every week, and there are people here that, that um, are sitting really comfortable and could use a little bit more firing up in their lives. One person said that the job of the preacher is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. So I try, on average, to every other time I preach or every third time I preach, to have something that might stir you up a little bit and, and then try to encourage it. And I'm hoping that's a, a well-balanced gospel diet. So this is going to be on the end of not just a warm, fuzzy, encouraging sermon. This is going to have some mental exercises that may be challenging. And I want to say at the outset that this is not going to be a completely satisfactory sermon. So you're going to walk away from th today and you're going to say, I didn't agree with some of those things. Or you're going to say, that helps, but I still have a lot of unanswered questions. Or you're going to say, man, it's still just really hard. So what happens at the end of this, I'm hoping, is not so much a grand resolution as much as a beginning of a conversation and an acknowledgement that it's okay to have questions and it's okay to engage with those as a community. And hopefully we see a more beautiful picture of God as a result of this. So that's what I'm aiming for, and what I wanted to do to kind of set the context is put a picture of this guy up here, and just by a showing of hands, how many of you would recognize this character? Okay, not a one of you. You'll recognize his name, some of you. This is Richard Dawkins. <laughs> a low murmur. <laughs> yeah, Richard Dawkins, he's one of uh, the last 20 years most... Uh, vehement atheists. He wrote a book uh, several years ago entitled The God Delusion. He's a British evolutionary scientist who was the Oxford Professor for Public Understanding of Science uh, chair from 1995 until 2008. Uh, he has a, a children's science program that he's released and he really sees it as his mission to help educate the world about scientific matters and particularly he's taken it as a, as a personal initiative to help rid the world of the conception of religion. This is one of his life goals, as it were. Uh, in his book, The God Delusion, he writes this. He says, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Of course, he sees the Bible as fiction. He says, Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, masochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. So basically what he says is you read the Old Testament description of who God is, and you walk away and you say, this is the worst figure in all of literature. Now you may find this curious that this is that same Richard Dawkins, and uh, I apologize for the graininess of the picture. I couldn't find a higher quality one, but he's wearing a t-shirt there that says, if you can read that, Atheists for Jesus. Atheists for Jesus. Now, when, uh, when asked about this, Richard Dawkins says, hey, you look at, the, at religion in the Bible, and it's a terrible, uh, particularly the Old Testament, it's a terrible, bloodthirsty, disgusting way of viewing the world. But you look at the way that Jesus interacts with people, and I don't believe he was the son of God by any stretch of the imagination, but his ethical system would really do the world a lot of good. So he's communicating that, that when you encounter the Old Testament God, there's this bloodthirsty monster at work. But when you look to Jesus, you find that there's a different reality and more uh, a drawing reality. There's, there's a presence there that is engaging, that's uplifting, that's worth emulating. And though you may not resonate with how he articulates it, I just want to ask for an honest show of hands this morning. 
How many of you, maybe through our Bible experience or through your own personal reflection, have had the experience where you say, what gives with the angry God of the Old Testament? Is anyone that's just been reading in the last couple of weeks in our experience here, and, and you've said, man, this is kind of uncomfortable. What's going on here? How do I square this with the forgiving God that I've come to know and love in Jesus? I thought uh, John Clark did an awesome job in his devotional this week of kind of bringing that sentiment to the, the forefront and dealing with it. He says, I I'm sure that we've all been involved in or at least heard discussions regarding the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament, how one was harsh and vindictive while the other was compassionate and healing. And so you have this, this picture, and I think John just nails it right there, that there's this sentiment that if you don't hold it, some of your friends undoubtedly do, but there's this sense in which it's uneasy for us at times to read the Old Testament. And we, we read it, and we kind of scratch our heads, and we say, I'm not really sure what's going on here. So again, what I want to say is that this is not going to be a satisfactory treatment. This is not going to be an exhaustive treatment. But what I wanted to do is go through a couple things, a couple nuggets, a couple ideas that might help bring a little bit of light to a situation that for many people is very uncomfortable. And I thought of it, uh, you know, often loggers would, would cut down trees and then they put them into the river and that would be the way to transport the logs downstream. But eventually one can kind of get jammed in place and then they begin piling up on each other and you get a little bit of a log jam and it stops all forward progress. And for many people, I would say that this tension is a log jam in their spiritual experience that prevents them from being able to move forward in really connecting with God more meaningfully and deeply. So what I'm hoping and what I've been praying is that this morning God will begin to break that log jam in our hearts and minds. Uh, if, it's, if this isn't something that you resonate with personally, then I'm hoping it's something that at least gives you a couple ideas that you can share with people that are struggling in these ways. And uh, of course, I hope this is just a conversation that we begin. Uh, what I want to do now is to invite you to open up your Bible with that kind of weighty and heavy introduction. I want to invite you to open up your Bible and look at an example of kind of some of the stuff that I'm talking about. And if you just go ahead and go to Numbers chapter 15, we'll find one instance in Scripture that I think kind of brings this to the forefront and helps us have a launching off point. So Numbers chapter 15 and verse 32 Numbers chapter 15, verse 32. If you've got a Bible, you've got a device, just pull that thing out. Numbers 15, verse 32. I want to go ahead and pray again, and then we'll, uh, we'll read Scripture together. Lord, we're coming to you asking for a really supernatural thing to happen. I don't have the wisdom, and we don't have the capacity to understand you. I don't know how to explain the things that you've laid on my heart in a way that does you does any sort of justice to how good and how awesome you are. And so I'm just asking that your Holy Spirit would be the mediary, mediary, uh, mediator, that, that he would come and, and translate things and that the words spoken would come from him, would come from Jesus and not from me. So open up our hearts and minds, give us compassion, and help us to know you more fully in Christ's name. Amen. I'm in Numbers chapter 15 in verse 32. If you're there, just go ahead and say Amen. All right. It says, Now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must surely be put, what? To death. And all the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. This is a representative example of some of the things that we're talking about. You see, in the New Testament, Jesus is encounter, uh, encounters a woman that's being threatened with being stoning, and, and at the end of that scene, the woman walks away not stoned. But here we've got a, a man that you know, seems to be doing something in our minds kind of trite. He's picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And so they take this guy and say to God, God, what should we do with him? And instead of a timeout, instead of a prison sentence, instead of some sort of lesser punishment, the mandate from God himself is he has to be stoned. And then we read that the Israelites carry that out. 
Now, this is difficult for us because if we read it in our context, in our, our modern ears, uh, it, it's really hard to imagine that happening in our community today, understandably so, and, and I'm not suggesting that it ought to happen. It ought not to happen in our community today. But, it, but it, there's a lot of difficulty that ensues when we read things like this, and this wouldn't be an isolated example. And so what I want to do is to begin looking at a couple of principles, a couple of things that I, I think are helpful and will help to uh, maybe shed some light on these kinds of passages. The first point I want to bring up is that our perspective is limited. Our perspective is limited. Annette, if you could do me a favor there, on the top left corner, there's a little icon on the screen that says Clear BKG. If you could just click on that, I think that'll help us going forward. Clear BKG in the top left corner. But our perspective is limited. So when we're reading through the Old Testament particularly, we're reading through a bunch of stories that are happening at breakneck speed. So when we encounter this man, all we know about him is that in the space of four verses, he goes from someone who simply breaks the Sabbath to someone that's put to death because God said to do it. His entire life is condensed down to a a nine-second narrative that we just read. When we look at these stories, and they're occurring at this speed, at this frequency, there's just so much that we have absolutely no clue about. Just so many things that, that we don't understand about what's happening in these stories. And so when we stand in judgment of them, or when we say, man, this is really uncomfortable, of course it's uncomfortable, but, but the reality is that oftentimes, with a fuller, broader picture, many of these things would begin to make more sense to us. So for instance, in this story, and, and again, I don't pretend that this is going to just ease the whole thing and, and make the, the thing go away, but just a couple things to consider. In the literary placement of this particular passage, you're talking about a nation of people that have been led miraculously out of slavery in Egypt. God has brought 10 plagues of justice on the Egyptians in order to free the Israelites. They've marched through a sea in which the waters, the Bible says, were congealed as they passed through on dry land. There's a pillar of fire that keeps them warm by night. It's the presence of God there. They're miraculously provided with food and water each day of their lives. There's a a visible, tangible evidence that God is leading them and that God communicates to them that they uh, ought to follow him and be holy. And in the middle of that, what we find is that that Numbers is telling the story of of sort of the... uh, the Magna Carta documents, the defining documents of the nation of Israel and establishing them as a people, as a nation. And God is leading them on a re-educational process so that he can eventually bless the entire world through them. And so when we come to this story, it's not as though this is a man who has just uh, accidentally picked up sticks on Sabbath or forgot about it. The way that the scriptures are describing it, this is a truant act that would be more in line with what we would consider as citizens today as treason. And so what you, what you have is, is this is a scene in which God is laying out the principles of his kingdom. And someone isn't just committing an accident or a slip up or, oh, I forgot. But the, but the idea is, is sort of God is saying, okay, we're entering into covenant to I'll be your God and you'll be my people. And this man is, is um, blatantly and violently marching into the midst of the camp in public, and he's basically saying to God, forget you. This is kind of an act of waving the middle finger at God. This is a, this is a way of, of burning God's proverbial flag, as it were. And it's not just an incidental, kind of isolated act. It's an attack at the very nation and existence of Israel and the leadership of God. I, I know that's not going to be completely satisfying to you, but the, the point, what I want to say with that is that there's a broader, bigger picture here that we just don't have access to. Like we read stories of people like Judas, who God uh, pled with and, and dealt with for years and years and years with great mercy and extended patience. And then we, we put them in, in kind of distinction to incidents like this, but the reality is we don't know how long and through what methods God has been pleading with this man. Does that make sense? Our perspective is limited. Uh, Another example in which I think this this comes to play is that in Exodus chapter 32, you remember this this scene we talked about a little bit. It's a very difficult passage in which Israel has marched out of Egypt. God is with Moses up on Mount Sinai. And 
the people of Israel say that God has rejected us. We want to go back to Egypt, so let's make a new God. And so Aaron builds them a golden calf. And then they worship that God, that new God. But they say about this new God, one of these Egyptian gods that they have now built an, uh, an idol of, this, this golden calf. They worship that God and they say, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. In response to that, God says to Moses, let me alone that I may destroy these people. And we say, man, that is really hard. And it is really hard. Uh, again, this is a heavy thing. I'm, I'm not pretending that it's not. But, but God says to Moses, let me alone that I may destroy them. And we say, man, why is God so angry? Why is he so ticked off? What gives? And Moses intercedes. And those people are spared because of Moses' intercession. Now, I made the point several weeks ago that I think what's happening there is a little bit of a role play in which God is heightening to the people of Israel and, and heightening to Moses their need for a mediator. But I want to just try on a little thought experiment to see if there might be another way of viewing that story that would expand the, the perspective and make it a little bit more understandable for us. Imagine with me for a moment if Moses had said to God, you're right. It's a just act. These people, uh, it's not just a, a slip up. This is a rebellion against you. These people are hard-hearted, and they have stubbornly chosen not to listen to you, and they deserve justice. Imagine what would have happened. We have a, uh, an insight into what this could have looked like. I'm not saying this is what would have happened, but this could have looked something like this. All the people over the age of 20 are judged at that time and are laid to rest. And then... The remaining Levites who were faithful to God, who didn't participate in this rebellion, along with the children of the, rebel, uh, the rebels, they march through the promised land for the rest of the time, and they go up to the banks of the promised land, the banks of the Jordan there, and God says, go in and take it. And it's very likely that they would, in fact, go in and take the promised land. Because uh, let me remind you that this group of people who is spared because of Moses' intercession, when, when Moses says to God, hey, spare these people, those same people will eventually go to the border of the promised land and say, God, we refuse to go in, and they'll rebel against God repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly until all of them eventually die in the wilderness during 40 years of wandering, right? So, so the fact that Moses interceded and these people were spared, we, we feel really good about that, but the reality is that that entire generation later went on to perish because of the continued rebellion that was evident right there at the outset. Is that making sense? Now, I'm not saying this is easy. I'm not saying this just sweeps everything under the rug. But what I'm saying is that there's a really big picture here, and it's not as though in the act of pardoning those people, the world became a better place. In fact, I think you could make a really, really strong case that the fact that God forgave those people ended up being more damaging to Israel going forward than if they would have endured judgment right then and there. Because the reality is that they had 40 years to influence their children and to continue to propagate their spirit of rebellion and unbelief on those children. So that when the Israelites did go into Egypt, there was a sense in which they were faithful to God, but there was a sense in which there was a lingering rebellion against God that plagued them not just for hundreds of years, but for thousands of years to this day. So the, the reality is, I'm not saying that that's what would have happened, and this may be speculative. The point I'm simply trying to make is that there are other ways to look at this story, and we just really don't know all the details. Uh, yesterday I was trying to see, you'll appreciate this, Stan. Yesterday I was trying to see a tufted duck. It's my nemesis bird. It looks exactly like every other duck that's in Portland on the river right now, except instead of having a, a sort of grayish back, it has a black back and it needs a haircut. A tufted duck has this, this sort of ponytail that reaches down, but it looks identical to the other hundreds and thousands of ducks that are out there. And so my wife and kids and I, we took a little bit of time, and we were trying to go see this bird that was down by the airport. I've been to Hood River trying to see this bird. I've stood in very cold, windy weather trying to see this stinking bird. <laughs> and as you can tell, I did not see that stinking bird yesterday. It's like looking for a needle in a, in a haystack, but the haystack is moving in the water, and every once in a while, the entire pile of hay gets up and flies somewhere else. And then you have to walk over and look for it again. 
On the way there, I was trying to look for a place to park because there was a, a, an area in which people had si- uh, allegedly sworn that they'd seen this bird. So I was driving the car, and my three-year-old son, he's not in here, so I can talk about him. Uh, he was in the, oh, he is in here. John, oh, you sneaky guy. Anyway, uh, it's okay. It was good. He was in the back seat, and he was talking about my driving, and as I was looking for a place to park, and uh, Chantel, my wife, was saying, hey, I don't think you can park there. Maybe you should go there. And my three-year-old pipes up in the back seat, and he says, Dad, you're going to crash. <laughs> Dad, you're going to crash. And I can understand where he's coming from. I can understand that to him it made sense to be a little bit concerned. At the time, we were going less than a mile an hour. Uh, But the simple point is I just bring that up to say that my three-year-old son has a concern that I appreciate and it's legitimate. And in fact, it's even evidence that he's beginning to see the world in in a more full, mature light. The fact that he has the concern says something about a developing reason that I'm really happy to see. But the reality is, he has no idea whether or not I'm going to crash in that moment because he doesn't drive. I've been driving for decades, right? His perspective is limited, and so to him, it seems this way. But there are other ways to see it, and I think the same is true for a lot of these difficult circumstances we see in Scripture. Now, uh, point number two, and, and we'll begin to speed up here a little bit. Point number two that we got to keep in mind when we're reading the Mosaic Law is that these laws were not ever given as a means in order for salvation to be accomplished, as though people would keep these laws and then somehow that would make them holy and they would be saved because of their adherence to the Mosaic Law. The function of the Mosaic Law, according to Scripture, is a a means of preserving the nation of Israel until the Messiah actually comes. And so what we find then is that sometimes God intervenes in the nation of Israel's history or through their laws in order to bring justice that limits the damage of sin. I want to say that again. Sometimes, for for the sake of preserving the nation of Israel until the Messiah comes, God intervenes in really decisive, dramatic ways in order to limit the damage that wickedness will do to the people. This is really uh, a fascinating little passage you can write down in Galatians chapter 3. Paul is writing about how you can't be saved by adherence to the law, but but all along the whole story has always been that you're saved because God made a promise to Abraham and he's going to keep it. You say amen to that? You're not saved because of how good you are. You're saved because God made a promise to set the world right. He made that promise to Abraham and he's going to fulfill that. And if you believe that, then you're in on the good story. And so he's writing then, and he's talking about, okay, then how do you make sense of the law? And Paul writes and says, And this I say, that the law, the Mosaic law, which was 430 years after the promise that was made to Abraham, does not annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. He's saying, God made a promise to Abraham. And just because the law was given to Israel 430 years later, does not mean that the original promise made to Abraham is changed or annulled. Like, the plan is still going on. It's still going to be fulfilled in the way that God said that it would to Abraham. And he goes on and he asks, uh, he he makes the statement, he says, For if the inheritance is of the law, it's no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So the point is, if you think you're going to save yourself by adherence to the law, then, then that's not about the promise anymore. That's about adherence to the law. But God didn't tell people that that's the way to achieve it. He said it on the basis of his promise to Abraham. And then he asks this really reasonable, logical question. He says, what purpose then does the law serve? And notice his answer. It was added because of what? Transgressions. It was added because of transgressions till the seed, that's Jesus, should come to whom the promise was made. So, so you ask Paul and say, hey, Paul, what's the function of the Mosaic Law? And he says at least part of the answer is that this was given to Israel because of their brokenness and backwardness so that there would still be a people of Israel by the time the Messiah came. You get what I'm saying? Like you read through this and you say, man, why are all these crazy laws in here? Because if those crazy laws weren't in there, there would be no one for Jesus to be born to. Now, this is, this is pretty weighty and this is heavy, 
But think about the specificity and the decisive way in which God intervenes in order to limit the effect of wickedness in the story of Israel. And yet, we start off with 12 tribes of Israel, and by the time Jesus is born, there are no longer 12 tribes of Israel. There are three tribes of Israel that are still remaining, and they're in a very small number. All you have left is Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. So the the point I'm making is that if God doesn't intervene and and take sort of um, drastic actions in order to preserve the promised people, there's going to be no one left. And even though he did intervene and take drastic actions, they almost thwarted him, and there was almost no one left by the time Jesus was born. Does that make sense? And so at times what, we've, what we read in Scripture is that God is, is very dramatic and decisive in the way that he acts, but he's trying to preserve people so that the Messiah can be born. Those of you that are parents recognize that you made laws about things you never thought you would have to make laws about. Right? I remember Monty telling me a story that I thought was really funny until my kids got to be the age of the, the kids that were in his story. Uh, I remember Monty Church telling me about, about his grandson who put a flashlight in the toilet. And then his father was one day carrying the toilet out, I, I think it was, after he finally figured out why the toilet was plugged up and didn't work. And the father didn't actually know that there was a flashlight in the toilet. He just knew the toilet didn't work and was clogged up and he couldn't figure it out. And as the toilet was coming out, the son said to the dad, Oh, I see you found my flashlight. <laughs> I think that was about the gist of it. Right? In our home, there are all kinds of rules about don't put that there, don't put that in your nose, don't put that in your brother's nose, don't stand on that, don't put that in there, don't touch that, that's yucky. There are all these things, and the reason is because if we don't address those really specific concrete needs, we won't have any kids left. <laughs> all right. Third simple point. Again, these will not all be satisfactory, but I think they'll help, and they'll start a conversation for us. Number three, the Mosaic law restricts retribution. The Mosaic law restricts retribution. I want to give you an instance of this. In Scripture, we find this admonition. If a man causes disfigurement of his neighbor, as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he has caused the disfigurement of a man, so shall it be done to him. And whoever kills an animal shall restore it, but whoever kills a man shall be put to death. You shall have the same law for the stranger and from one from your own country, for I am the Lord your God. Now, this is not an isolated instance. Jesus will refer to this law called the lex teloni, the the idea, you know, you repay with strict justice. If someone knocks out your tooth, then their tooth is knocked out. If someone knocks, uh, knocks your kneecap, then their kneecap is knocked. If someone takes your eye out and gouges it, then their eye is taken out and gouged it. And often we read this as a barbaric law, as a bloodthirsty, cruel law. And I just want to say a couple things about that. First of all, remember that that in this context, we're dealing with a culture in which there is no penitentiary. There's no prison. So how do you bring about justice in a society in, in which people are traveling for decades through the wilderness? It's not like you can lock people up. What do you do? Again, or or moreover, I just want to point out that though we read this as as an admonition that makes it sound like you have to be really aggressive and like, you know, oh, you know, Chantel knocked out my tooth and I really hate to do this, babe, but I got to knock out your tooth. I just want to remind you that there were places and continue to be places in the world in which if you are caught stealing an apple in a market, what would happen? Your hand is removed immediately. No trial. It happens, right? So the, the, I think the brilliance of this law is that it recognizes that human nature is bent not on just retribution, but it's bent on going over the top and not just getting even, but going beyond even. He knocked my tooth out. I'm going to knock all his teeth out. He gouged my eye. I'm going to take both of his eyes, right? I'll remind you that the person who wrote this law was the one who saw someone abusing a slave And what did he do to him? He struck him so that he died. Right? Moses himself is someone who went beyond what the law predicates here. And he applied more force than had been given originally. 
And so this law, in reality, I think upon closer inspection, is a limitation on retribution, not an admonition to go farther. Right? Someone breaks your arm and you say, man, I'm going to kill him. And the law says, no, no, you can't do that. You can repay them an equal measure to what you received. This is a sensible law, and, and I'll remind you that, that in large regard, this is an undergirding foundational premise to the legal system that we appreciate today, that there ought to be some sort of equality in the legal system. Moses is speaking in a culture in which there are, uh, there are people that if their children dishonor them or bring dishonor on the family, that person can be killed instantly. And Moses says, no, no, no. If there's a, a rebellious, wayward son... And, and he refuses to follow you. You can't just take matters into your own hands, but you have to go to the elders, and as a community, they have to pass judgment on him. What it tends to do, what the law tends to do in this instance, is move away from brutality and move toward a limitation of justice, uh, move toward a, an equality in justice, so people aren't just out there vigilantes taking matters into their own hands. Is that making sense? Apparently not. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, this, this can go out on a lawn, but I want to go on to the next point. Uh, now, this, I really debated whether or not to include this, but I thought it was important, and I'll tell you why. The so-called severity of God that we see in the Old Testament is actually present in the New Testament, too. And the reason why I bring this up is because it's really tempting to read certain portions of Scripture and say, man, that doesn't really sound like the God we know. Let's minimize that portion of Scripture. Let's not read it as much. Let's not talk about it as much. Let's not acknowledge that that was uh, a true expression of the love of God. And let's focus on Jesus. But the reality is that when we move to the New Testament, this same sort of dramatic, uh, what, what we might call severity, is actually on display. And uh, I could just draw your attention to a couple examples. In Acts chapter 12, Herod is speaking and taking the glory that belongs to God alone, and he's judged and drops dead right there at the moment. In Acts chapter 4 and 5, you have Ananias and Sapphira that are trying to defraud widows by taking the, the financial capacity that was available for widows, and uh, they, they act as though you know, they should get in on this too and that they're really destitute because they've donated all their means. And God dramatically steps in and intervenes, and they are judged, both die on the spot. So the reason why I bring this up, and I really hesitated, because I thought, man, if people are, are feeling hard about God in the Old Testament, I don't want to just make it worse for them. But what I want to say is that the reality is that God is, is consistent throughout, and that if we end up just cutting portions of Scripture out that we don't like, people have done this throughout history, and you know what always ends up happening? You always end up making God look like yourself. If every time you hear something from God, you don't like it and you minimize it or get rid of it, you will ultimately make yourself God and you will reduce and cut down the Bible until all that you have left is who you are. And this will actually destroy you because the reality that Scripture is teaching is that we're made in the image of an awesome and beautiful God, but that we've fallen from it and we need to repent and come into alignment with his beautiful holiness. And so that's part of the reason why I wanted to, to bring this up. Uh, furthermore, I just wanted to, uh, to highlight that it's not just the New Testament that you'll find the severity. It's actually in Jesus himself. Jesus looks people squarely in the eye and he says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. When's the last time your children's ministry leader spoke that way? Right? Like we have this conception that Jesus was just uh, the consummate politeness, but he spoke very directly and very forcibly to people. Uh, and it's not just a, a one-off. You read Matthew 23 this afternoon. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? You remember Jesus speaks with Nicodemus, that beautiful passage in which he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But when that passage look, begins, 
He looks Nicodemus in the eye after Nicodemus says, you're an amazing teacher. Jesus looks him square in the eyes and he says, unless you're born again, heaven is not your home. So what I'm saying to you is that, that the severity, so-called, that we find in the Old Testament is actually present in the New Testament. And curiously, when you speak of the final destruction of the wicked, Jesus speaks about the final destruction of the wicked in hell more than any other single person in the Bible. Does that make sense? So we're not evading anything if we just try to say, man, angry Old Testament God. Uh, it's, it's somber, I know. Um, Another example, for the sake of time, we'll, we'll pass by. But we could multiply examples of this. My point is not to say that God is angry and cruel consistently. My point is to say that there is more to love than we acknowledge at first. And that leads us to our next point, number five. True love demands justice. True love demands justice. We live in a culture in which being non-judgmental is touted as the highest value. Is that true? We live in a culture in which the highest value is that we let people do whatever they want. But this is actually not love. This is apathy and indifference. And if, if truth is told, we would say that it's cruelty. It's no surprise. It's no shock. There are cultural reasons for all this, and people have been excessively judgmental, and there's a violent religious history. This is all true. But it's no surprise that in our day and age there's a... a a Roman church state system that is enduring ongoing criticism because people who were in positions where they had the power and the knowledge to act, to intervene, to protect the vulnerable, did not. And the, the cry, the righteous cry of people is, why didn't you step in and bring about justice? The reality is that, that many of us don't like the concept of justice because our lives and this is not meant to be uh, sweeping across the board, but our lives in the West are remarkably free from injustice. Consistently in Scripture, the cry to God was, bring about justice because I am unjustly afflicted and oppressed. Justice in Scripture was always seen as an act of a loving God bringing salvation to oppressed people. But the reality is that my life is so comfortable that I really don't need God to, to step in and bring justice because my life is really great. And the reason why it's pretty great and the reason why many of us in the West are remarkably free from injustice is because we live in a culture that was built upon the principles that we're talking about that are difficult and hard for us. I, I wish we had more time to kind of explore this, but I just want to bring up this uh, famous theologian Miroslav Volf. If you haven't read his book, Exclusion and Embrace, you really owe it to yourself to read it. It's a remarkable book on forgiveness, but just notice what he says here. I think it's powerful. He says, I used to think that wrath was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love, and God loves every person and every creature. That's exactly why God is wrathful against some of them. My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of, of the war in former Yugoslavia the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed and over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination. We couldn't talk about, them, uh, talk about it specifically here because it wouldn't be appropriate to talk about the heinousness of what was done. And he says, and I could not imagine God not being angry. Or think of Rwanda in the last decade of the past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in, one of the, in 100 days. How did God react to the carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in a grandparently fashion? By refusing to condemn the bloodbath but instead affirming the perpetrators' basic goodness? Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. Do you catch the force of it? He's saying, it came to the point where I said, man, I couldn't serve a God who didn't get angry when he saw the injustice of the world. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. The wrath of God as expressed in Scripture is the righteous response of an all-loving parent to the plight of his children, causing and enduring evil. 
And so God steps in and, and he brings about justice. Man, I, this is so good. I, I just, I got to read this. Satan deceives me. This is written by one of the founders of the Adventist movement, Ellen White, and she's commenting on the experiences of Israel coming out of Egypt, going into the promised land. And she, uh, this statement, you should really take a picture of this. You should highlight this. You should hang on to this because this is really significant. Satan deceives many with the plausible theory. What kind of theory? Plausible. Now, what's a, what's a synonym for plausible? Believable, possible. Okay, now notice what the theory is that she says is believable or that is possible. Satan deceives many with the plausible theory that God's love for his people is so great that he will excuse sin in them. He represents that while the threatenings of God's word are to serve a certain purpose in his moral government, they are never to be literally fulfilled. Right? There's this idea that God is too good and he's too loving to actually fulfill the judgment that he says he will bring. And the, the thing is that when, when Ellen White is describing this particular concept, she says that this is a plausible idea. Why is it plausible? Why could you hear that and say, yeah, that makes sense. I could see that. Because God is so compassionate, because he's so loving. Because God is so good and because he's so loving and he's so merciful and so willing to forgive anyone who does anything, you could hear someone say that God will never actually destroy the wicked and say, you know what, I could see that. But she goes on and says that, that many people are deceived by this. And she says, but in all his dealings with his creatures, God has maintained the principles of righteousness by revealing sin in its true character by demonstrating that its sure result is misery and death. The, uncon the unconditional pardon of sin never has been and never will be. Such pardon would show the abandonment of the principles of righteousness, which are the very foundation of the government of God. It would fill the unfallen universe with consternation. God has faithfully pointed out the results of sin, and if these warnings were not true, how could we be sure that his promises would be fulfilled? If he just said, hey, the wicked are going to be destroyed, and he never intends to actually keep that, then how can we know that his promises that he'll save are true? She goes on and says, that so-called benevolence, which would set aside justice, is not benevolence, but weakness. God is the life giver. From the beginning, all his laws were ordained to life, but sin broken upon the order that God had established, and discord followed. So long as sin exists, suffering and death are what word? Inevitable. And it is only because of, it is only because the Redeemer has borne the curse of sin on our behalf that man can hope to escape in his own person its dire results. What's she saying? She's saying that you could almost believe that God will pardon all sin even if people don't want to be forgiven. But the reality is that if you do that, you will perpetuate evil and wickedness throughout all eternity. And you will actually turn the, the benevolence of God into cruelty, and he will perpetrate an ongoing violence against his people, against humanity. C.S. Lewis, in his, his just brilliant uh, ability to encapsulate things, he says, Love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. Here's the reality. God will do as much good to people as they will allow him to do. People don't acknowledge God. God will squeeze goodness into their lives in ways that they don't notice that it's him. He'll give them amazingly ripe avocados that are delicious. He'll give them people, friends that love them and care about them. He'll bless them with health and the ability to think clearly. He'll, he'll squeeze his goodness into their lives in whatever way he can. But when people resolutely refuse God's goodness, the only gift at times he has left to give to people is non-existence. Sometimes the last good gift that God can give to people is rest from their wickedness. And I don't say that lightly. This is heavy. This is solemn. Moving on, point number six. We'll, we'll wrap this up real fast. Point number six. It is true in Scripture that there are scenes in which God is described as, as bringing about a judgment. But I am unaware of a passage in Scripture that explicitly says anytime God acts to end someone's life in judgment, 
that that is equivalent to ensuring that they are not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. You get what I'm saying? I'll say it a different way. There are times in which someone falls dead because of their, their sin against God. But I am personally unaware of a passage in Scripture that confirms that person will necessarily then not be in heaven. In fact, there are instances in which people die as a judgment of God, and we know that they are not lost. For instance, the person who wrote the first five books of the Bible, Moses himself, will die on a mountain as a judgment from God. And he would plead for mercy from him, and God was angry with Moses, the Scripture says, and was laid to rest, Aaron, his brother, would also die as an act of divine judgment against him. But we find Moses pleading with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Later, he was resurrected, the book of Jude says, and is currently enjoying heaven, the heavenly promised land. Can you say amen? So when we read of these people that experience judgment, we don't necessarily need to imply that that, that confirms that their judgment is uh, you know, sealed right there. It may be the case, but I am not personally aware of a scripture that describes that. And furthermore, I just want to, to bring out the point, some people have often said, why does God resurrect the wicked at the end of the thousand years just to destroy them again? Because before God executes final judgment, he waits for unanimous consent from all who have ever lived that this is the right thing to do. Scripture describes before God finally uh, sets the wicked to their final rest in the fires of hell. The scriptures describe that, that God will have unanimous consent from both the righteous and the wicked, saying, true and righteous are your judgments. This is what we deserve. Every knee bows and tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. And so before God executes final judgment, everyone is in on the same page. The data is released. Everyone is able to see things and says, yeah, that's exactly what I would have done if I were as good as God. If I knew what he knew, if I was God in his position, that's exactly the right thing to do. Just want to lighten it up for a second here. If you had a chocolate chip cookie, who would you give it to? Myself. Oh. Oh, banished. Banished. No, if you had to give that cookie away, who would you give it to? Someone who likes chocolate chip cookies? Oh, man, I see some spousal sharing going on here. And you guys are conspiring to get a chocolate chip cookie for yourself. You're thinking, if I give one to him, he'll give one to me. Happy story. Okay. Now, if there were someone that needed a kidney, and you were going to give your kidney to them, picture the faces and the names that would be on the short list that you would give your kidney to. Would that list be a little bit different than people that you might be willing to give a chocolate chip cookie to? The people that are on your list that you would give a kidney to, what does that say about your relationship to those people? It's deep. You're giving away part of yourself to them. It wouldn't just be anyone. It would be a, an amazing act of love and compassion. Who are the people that you would lay down your life for? I didn't know until I got married. I looked my wife in my eyes and I thought for the first time, this is the person that I would lay down my life for. I remember when our son was born, our first son was born, and um, they immediately had to rush him into the, the kind of extra care unit because he was having difficulty breathing. They had all these wires and things hooked up to him and a uh, curious story, he actually was born with extra fingers. You can ask him about it. It's really interesting. He has little marks where you can see he used to have kind of extra pinkies. And so when we told our parents on the phone kind of the story of what was happening in the birth, they were like super worried, <laughs> you know, because it didn't sound good at all. You know, he's got 12 fingers, and they're like, huh? And we're like, no, <laughs> really. <laughs> he holds them. It's very cute. Anyway, when I held my son, I looked in his eyes, and I felt like my heart had left my body and had these little legs and arms. And I felt so vulnerable. But I knew I would lay down my life for that little boy. We had another son that was born. He came out with a normal number of digits. Really cute in a different way. And I held him and again I said, I would lay down my life for this boy. 
I would give my kidney to other people, but my life, I would lay down for the people that I love most. Who are the people that you would lay down your life for? I want to remind you that everyone who has ever come under the righteous and just judgment of God has been more loved by God as their father than you have ever loved anyone in your life. To the extent that I was willing to lay down my life for my children and for my family, that love has been dwarfed by the love of Jesus who laid down his life, not just for those who will be saved, but those who will ultimately reject his goodness and mercy. Everyone who has fallen under the judgment, the, the righteous judgment of God, has been more loved by Jesus than you have ever loved anyone in your life. So this is heavy. This is hard. But I just want to remind you that God is good and he's merciful and the reality that he'll bring sin to an end is a source of encouragement to us because it reminds us that affliction isn't going to go on forever and someday pain will be a thing of the past. Paul says, if we're beside ourselves, it's for God. If we have a sound mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then everyone died. And Jesus did die for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The reality of Scripture, the good news of the gospel message is that Jesus didn't just die for Israelites or for his favorites, but he laid down his life for all. The book of Titus says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Paul would write in Romans, and he would say that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. And the reality this morning is that no matter who you are and what your story has been, whether or not you choose to follow God or reject God with your life, you will be able to look him in the eyes one day and say to him, no matter your fate, you are the one that has loved me truly. Everyone is loved by God and is more loved, even those who fall under judgment, than the one that you have loved the most. And so this morning, I want to say to you that there are good reasons to believe this is not comprehensive and this is not completely satisfying, but I believe that the scriptures in their whole, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, in the Chronicles of Narnia, point to the reality that God is not safe, but He's good. I want to invite you to embrace and to live in that goodness this morning. To allow Jesus to be your Savior and embrace the Holy Spirit who will work in your life and transform you and bring you newness. We were going to sing Come Thou Fountain, but I think for the sake of time we should forgo it today. I'm really sad to do that, though. Well, what I want to... I want to invite you to stand. We'll pray together. Maybe we'll sing it as a postlude. God, we've dealt with weighty things, and we don't pretend that this is a full or a comprehensive or even satisfactory answer to everyone in here, even myself included. There are things that are hard for us. There are things that are difficult for us. There are things that we say, man, God, why? We don't understand. But today we affirm that Jesus is Savior of all, and we confess that we believe that you're good and holy. Lord, help us to live in light of that reality today. In Jesus' name, amen.